We know the term Ghostbuster pretty darn well. It's become a part of pop culture. But back before the original movie came out, like well over 40 years before that, the job would have been called a ghost breaker or ghost chaser or ghost exterminator. And one of the famous ones was Edward Saint. Straight up, I don't believe in ghosts, but I'm open-minded. In general, I don't normally believe in psychics, mediums, etc., but I did see one particular clairvoyant three different times a long time ago, and she was pretty darn good. So I'm also open-minded when it comes to that. I love me some ghost hunting shows. Most Haunted UK is a longtime favorite. And ghostly movies. I'm a skeptic who likes to be entertained. And should I ever be visited? Great. I hope it's someone I know so we can chat. Whatever you believe in is what you believe. I'm not here to poo-poo anyone's beliefs. It's all fascinating to me. But enough about me. Let's go to the topic of our conversation today. Edward Saint was a magician and friend of the famous Harry Houdini and his wife Beatrice, who went by Bess. We talked about this briefly in a story quite some time ago, but... But Houdini was a very famous magician, illusionist, escape artist, and absolutely against the fad of these times, spiritualism. Mediums were coming out in droves, telling all kinds of stories about people's loved ones, and whether they were fake or not, people were paying the money to get readings. Houdini railed against this practice, very publicly. Before he died, he and his wife Bess made a pact that, after he died, she would have a seance once a year to reach out to a spirit. They had a secret password that if his ghost communicated this password to her during the seance, then Bess would know that ghosts were indeed real. Houdini actually died on Halloween 1926. So once a year on his death anniversary, Bess would hold a seance accompanied by Edward Saint, called in the newspaper as her spiritualist and manager. He would actually conduct the seance, held before magicians, spiritualists, public officials, newspaper people, and over 200 of Houdini's friends. And for 10 years in a row, nothing happened. At the 10th year, 1936, there would be no longer a point to continue on with it. Bess would say she had given up all hope and would not try again. The story about Edward came to me in 1941, And already at this point, he had been busy ghost chasing for 20 years and had an interest in the practice for 30 years. His clientele, interestingly, are mostly real estate agents, which at first sounds odd, but yeah, you'd like to be able to sell a house that is not only clean of dirt, but clean of ghosts. And that's where Edward comes in. No, this has nothing to do with exorcism. There is no talk about demons or demonic presences in this particular story, and there is seemingly no religious aspect to what Edward does. I can't say there has never been. My research is based on what was in the newspapers. Anywho, in 1941, he actually told his own story directly to a newspaper. And just wait, something he says may throw you for a loop, given his chosen profession. So he's working with a client in a small town near Tampa, Florida, waiting for the ghost to show up. And as he says it, quote, spirits are never punctual. You have to wait hours, sometimes days before they turn up, end quote. Indeed, given all the ghost hunting shows I've watched over the years, this does seem to be true sometimes. His client said as they waited, quote, I just felt a cold breeze against my forehead. Isn't that a sign that a spirit is near? End quote. Edward internally blamed his client's feeling as that of someone who was extremely nervous. The so-called spirit breeze is just the cold sweat that breaks out on someone who is nervous. Does Edward get the cold sweats? No. As he says it, quote, of course, my hands and brow were dry because I know from 20 years experience that ghosts do not exist, end quote. Wait, what? Yeah, except just wait a mo. He continues, quote, however, I did not criticize the man who made that remark for just then I felt on my hand the softest caressing touch imaginable, end quote. Huh. 
So the purpose of him de-haunting this particular establishment was at the request of the mayor of the health resort he was currently at, in an old two-story house that had been empty for ages. People refused to stay more than one night in it because something or someone would come out in the dark and caress their hands, face, and neck. No gender or age group was discriminated against. The ghost liked everyone, which is nice. But no, not when you're trying to sell this house and you can't because something or someone ethereal is getting a little fresh. The petting ghost intrigued Edward because this was new for him. Edward whispered to the group, quote, I've been touched. Watch, end quote. The ghost then lifted its finger, and some moments later, Edward was touched again. He hit the on button of his flashlight, as did the others, to expose the ghostly apparition, and everyone gasped because it was a huge spider, which, after caressing Edward's hand with two of its legs, disappeared back into a hole in the wall. But what? Yeah. The house was occupied with large spiders, some two to four inches across, including its legs. I'm not going to pretend these are huge spiders. They may be for we Americans, but I hear that Australia's just got all kinds of scary stuff going on down there. Not a contest. You win, Australia. You win. So, of course, during the daytime and when there was house activity, the spiders were hesitant to leave their dark abode. Why venture out and get smushed by a shoe? But at night, woohoo! Party! Look at all of these loud, noisy humans laying still. What are these creatures? Let's crawl over them and see. Well, of course, that caused these strange human creatures to freak the hell out, blaming ghosts instead of spiders. Unfortunately for the spiders, the house was then fumigated and the petting ghosts, aka spiders, were uh, obliterated. Edward tells another tale of a house in Washington, Indiana, who apparently had a ghostly resident who liked to walk back and forth across the length of the house at night. Edward was told by everyone that they had seen her from outside of the house, through the windows. Why would she do this? Well, there was a tale to tell. Horrifically, the story was that in life, the lady had accidentally swallowed a needle, which apparently traveled around inside of her body, causing her excruciating pain as it moved. So painful, she couldn't sleep, and she would walk the floor at night, yelling in pain and holding out her arm. Eventually, she died. No more screaming. But she kept up her nightly walking vigil with a so-called spirit lamp in her hand. Edward was told all of this by the real estate agent who gave him a house tour and the keys. Edward returned to the house at nine and saw, as he drove up, a light passing through room to room, showing through the windows. He followed the moving inside light with his car and then turned around at the end of the house. And the light also turned and went back through the house the way it came. He didn't have to go into the house to see what was what. He went on and got a good night's sleep. The next morning, he met the agent and returned the keys. The ghost light was a reflection of the light on the window from passing cars, combined with old window pane glass that was wavy, compared to modern 1941 glass that was flat. Get you some new fangle flat pane windows and you're good. Now, being that Edward was friends with the Houdinis and had his own reputation as well, He name drops having had a chat with one Thomas Edison at the fairgrounds of the Jones Circus. The owner of the circus asked Edward for his assistance in getting rid of a ghost. Edward was like, nah, he just wanted to chat up Thomas Edison. Until Mr. Jones, the circus owner, said that it was in a stateroom of one of the circus's Pullman train cars. Color Edward intrigued. As the story went, a man had recently died in the stateroom and the porter kept the stateroom locked to protect the dead man's belongings. But through that locked door was weird, odd snapping and clicking noises. Through a little tiny bit of window shade not quite covering the whole window, there appeared to be some sort of white, wraith-like object moving about. Other performers on the train were contemplating leaving their rooms, which they rented for $15 a week because of the apparent haunting. This ghost was going to cost the circus some money. Mr. Jones was reluctant to open the stateroom for Edward, but you want this ghost out, you gotta. 
Finally, Mr. J unlocked it and stood still, not wanting to open the door until Edward said he pushed Mr. Jones in. A white cloud flew out of the stateroom and into their bodies, eyes and mouths, and flew past them. The porter standing nearby ran like hell, and I'm not sure he ever returned. Mr. Jones and Edward, though, would stay and see what happened. Well, the deceased man, before he died, had bought a crap ton of Mexican jumping beans. If you don't know about these, basically the beans jump because inside each bean is a worm, which is alive, hence the snaps and clicks. At some point, as nature deems fit, the worms make their way out of the beans and hatch into small white butterflies. That wraith-like being that could be seen in the little bit of window? The butterflies. The white cloud flying out of the door just now? The butterflies, wanting to get the hell out of this tiny room and to freedom. Edward details an old story from back in 1927, Calgary. Apparently, the ghost of an old man walked down the stairs most nights. Slowly. Hence why everyone assumes it must be an old man because of how slowpoke he was going. Edward and a party of four went to the supposed haunted house with flashlights at the ready. The party sat on the first floor in view of the stairs and waited for three hours. But then boom, they heard the slow, measured footsteps going down the stairs, one by one. When Edward gave the signal, the party rushed to the foot of the stairs in their prearranged places and show their light in the designated place. As the entire stairway was lit up, there was a streak of gray as the ghost disappeared. Holy crap! Well, yeah, if you're afraid of rats, because a giant rat leaped from the middle of the stairway and over the banister in one huge leap, and quickly he had disappeared. The rat would apparently run along one step and drop to a thud on the next step, run along that step, and drop to the next step, and, and so on. Hence the slow sounding walk. Blood spots on the floor that never go away? In the walls without proper drainage or from a leaky roof, you may find rainwater coupled with vines or leaves. And then the water seeps down to the floor and pulls up in a reddish liquid. During a lecture campaign of his own in the early 20s, Edward had offered $1,000 to anyone that could take him to a haunted house that had an active ghost. He never had to pay it. But Edward isn't happy about that, actually. He said, quote, It would be the best investment I could possibly make. If one authentic ghost could be found, it would instantly make our profession the most important in the world. End quote. What does Edward think a competent psychic investigator would be like? He said, quote, We do not deny there may be spirits because we do not know. We do know that there is no reliable evidence that one ever returned to this world. Nevertheless, we would be as delighted as any medium to find such evidence because it would be the happiest discovery of all time. However, we are looking for a gold mine, not a gold brick. End quote. This is how I feel about it, too. As Agent Mulder's poster in his office would state, I want to believe. But it's hard to in the days of being unable to trust people, charlatans, and fakers. Hope you enjoyed this spooky story. I'll have another one next week. See you. <laughs>